It's one of those things that, as having a parent who has raised four children in church, one of the most stressful things is when our children make noises, right? However, for me, that is one of the most blessing things in a church, is have the voice of a child. Um, so many churches now, as I talk to, they just don't have any kids. They have no young families. And so I just want to encourage parents that even though sometimes those are some of the most stressful things that we hear is that we, we want our children with us. We want our children experiencing worship with us. We want them to hear the songs about Christ and about our Savior. And so I just, every once in a while, I think I need to remind people and say that out there that our children are welcome and they need to be here. So um, I just want us to be clear on that. So as we go into our prayer for our um, sermon this morning, let us just bow our heads and close in prayer. Close in prayer. It's over already, I guess. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the families that you have brought here, for the children and for those that have come before us that are wise and pass their experience back down to younger families, Lord. We just pray as we enter into your word today that your Holy Spirit will speak to us as we go to the words that you spoke through this unknown author, that we will hear you, God, that we will hear your voice and your will and your commands and your love for us, Lord. May we be convicted by your words, encouraged by them, and may they lead to change in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So as we come today, we are back in Hebrews, and we're going to be in there for a while as we have already figured out. But we've been going through the first two chapters of Hebrews. The first two chapters of Hebrews are the beginning of a thought where he talks about this author that we do not know, speaks of the supremacy or how great Jesus is, the superiority of Christ, and we've already looked at like chapter 1 and, and the beginning of chapter 2, but this is one thought. So we're going to go back to chapter 1 real quick and read the beginning of chapter 1 and just put ourselves as this is the encompassing thought over what's happening here. And it says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at, at different times and in different ways. In these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs." So the author establishes right at the very beginning who Christ is by title, by position, by place, and that everything that we have will be coming from who Christ is. And everything he's going to continue to teach on is from that. And so he brings forth this preamble, this, this basic summary of the whole book. And then for the rest of chapter 1, he goes into correcting uh, a false belief in the authority of angels that was in the church as we've discussed in the last couple weeks. Um, and he uses that to re-emphasize who Christ is. And he gets to chapter 2, which we went in last week, and he stops after he builds up this, this big uh, build-up to who Christ is. He stops and he calls for action. He calls for his readers to respond at the beginning of 2. And so in the chapter 2, it says, For this reason, we must pay attention all the more to what we have heard, so we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding, and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This salvation had its beginning when it was spoken of by the Lord, and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to His will. So he is speaking to the gathered church there. And as he's speaking to them, he warns the church in general, and he warns of this drifting away. Drifting away from what? As we spoke last week, it's from the message that Christ 
is Savior. That if we're not careful, if we not pay close attention, that this message will slip right on by. And we have seen that this group of people has heard the message. They have heard uh, the saving message of Christ, and they are warned not to ignore it or not to neglect it. These are people who have heard the Word of God. They know what it has said up to this point. They've been presented with the Gospel. And many of them, even though they may enjoy the life of the community of believers, they may enjoy what they get from that, they may enjoy the Christian lifestyle, they may enjoy how they've been treated, but in reality, these are people in the church that have not accepted or have not developed saving faith in Christ. Because if they had never heard the message, they wouldn't have to worry about neglecting it because they wouldn't have heard it. And if they had faith in Christ, they wouldn't be worried about escaping because they are secured in Christ. And the author gave three reasons in that section to respond to the message of Christ. One was, look at chapter 1. This is who Christ is. Who Christ is, what He's done, what He has accomplished, where He sits, His authority, that should be what you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if that's not enough, he then gives the warning, the just punishment for those that don't believe. That we have a God that's just, and because he's just, then he gives punishment and blessing as appropriate to the behavior and the actions of the people. And then he says the third reason is if, if, if the punishment isn't enough, and if who the message is about isn't enough, then how about the one who confirmed the message and that God worked with the eyewitnesses through miraculous signs and wonders and gifts to affirm what was being said and spoken of. And so he gives us this, this kind of this plea for people to kind of open up their eyes and take a look. He's basically saying, here is Jesus who is the author of all of this. And then he starts to correct some of the beliefs. And then he comes back and says, will you respond to that? Will you have a saving faith in Christ? And after that, he comes into where we're going to start today. And the rest of chapter 2 is basically one way as he works through the salvation message. Um, and he looks at it from a point of view as he will continue to develop these thoughts throughout the entire book of Hebrews. But we get into chapter or the middle of chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verse 5 all the way to the end. So we have the whole, this is one thought, and we're going to go over the beginning of this section today. And it says, For he has not subjected to the angels the world to come, that we are talking about. But someone somewhere has testified, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time, you crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subject to him. But we do see Jesus, made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and, the one, and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him, and again, here I am with the children God gave me. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding power over death, that is, the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring." Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, so he could become like, so he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God, to make atonement for sins of his people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. 
So we're going to look at the first paragraph here, verses 5 through 9. And just a little side note here, as I've looked through and studied this thing, um, there's a little bit of vagueness in the section we're going to go through just because he doesn't use very specific words at times. And so there's a lot of commentaries that kind of get into the weeds on, on what things mean and stuff. And we're going to try really carefully to stay close to the word today, stay close to what it does say, and stay close to what we know it says so he starts with, with this thing and he says that there is a world to come. And he says this world that we're already talking about. So what world is that? Well, if you go back to Hebrews uh, 1, 6, it says again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and let all, angels, all God's angels worship him. So the Greek word used here is used in both places. It is a word that is speaking of uh, inhabited world. It is not the heavens or some other thing. It is a very specific word, meaning an inhabitable world. And that world is to come at some point in time in the future. So as they're speaking of this thing, there's something that has not yet been accomplished. And he says that he has not subjected the angels to this world to come. This world that we're talking about. So there's this new world. And contrary to the belief of many of the Jews of the period, they believed that the angels would rule in some way in this new world. That there was this thought because of some of the Old Testament references to how the, Jew, or how the angels uh, participated in different acts in the Old Testament. They had come to the conclusion that in the new world, when it would come, that the angels would have this overemphasis of authority over things. But he says here for the... For, the new world is not subjected to the dominion of angels. And the question we could ask is, is why is there confusion about that? Why would the Jewish people have confusion about that? And even today, why would people have confusion about that? And one of the things that we, we recognize in Scripture is that in the world that we exist in today, and the world that they existed in when this was written, that the angels do have power in our world today as in they have dominion. 1 John 5.19 says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Well, who's the evil one? That's Satan, the fallen angel, Lucifer. Ephesians 2, 1-3 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient, we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. So you have the spirit of the air. Once again, this is a reference to, to Satan, to the devil. Ephesians 2.12 says, for, or 6.12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. So what he's trying to make clear is even though we look at Scripture and we see that uh, we have angels, fallen angels, that have a certain level of authority, certain level of power in our world, that the new world to come, this would not be. That the new world to come would not have dominion by angels. And that what we do have in our current structure is temporary. And he continues on in, in verses 6 through 8 with this very interesting statement, but someone somewhere has testified. That seems like a very like wishy-washy way of saying stuff. If someone came up to you and said, you know, hey, can you testify in court? And someone said, someone somewhere once said, isn't that how most of the time people claim information? Someone somewhere. But he says, someone somewhere has testified. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him lower than the angels for a short time. You crowned him with glory and honor and subjected everything under his feet. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. As it is, we do not yet see everything subjected to him. So the author says, someone somewhere has testified. And then he starts quoting some Old Testament scriptures. You'll notice in the book of Hebrews, the author is so focused on making sure that these readers understand that the Old Testament Word of God, the Old Testament, is the Word of God. That he leaves out all references 
to the actual writers, to the actual people who penned God's word. So as you go through Hebrews, he was going to quote Old Testament throughout the entire thing. And in every instance, his goal, as he references back to Old Testament, is that these are the words of God. That these aren't the words of David, these aren't the words of other people. They're the words of God through, as in this case, David. Here he is quoting a portion of Psalm 8. And as he goes through this, uh, he's quoting the Greek translation. So we're going to read the, the one in our Bibles today, but we'll talk about some differences there. So here's what Psalm 8 says. So he's pointing back to the Old Testament. He's trying to affirm that these are God's words. It says, a Psalm of David, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name through all the earth. As you go through that and you look back at the quote that we just read and the translation here, there's one word that really kind of sticks out differently. Did you read the word angel in there anywhere? No. In verse 5, there is a word Elohim, which is translated as heavenly being. And in heavenly beings, there are two. There's God and angels, right? And so as they went through this, it could be translated either way. And as you read this in most English translations, many of them, the CSB translates it as God when referring to Psalm 8. If you're in the ESV, it will actually translate it as heavenly being, not picking which one. Uh, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation that the author is quoting, they quoted it directly and they used the word uh, the Greek word angelos for angel. So he's taking some of that translation um, vagueness out and put in the word angelos for angel, which was the Jewish understanding of that scripture at the time. So we see David in this psalm. He's looking up. Have you ever been out camping far enough away from all the lights that you can actually see some of the stars that are really out there, not the ones that you just see. I mean, think of being in David's time, somewhere out in the middle of a field, whether he was with his sheep, where there's no fire, there's no nothing, there is no light pollution on the face of the planet. Can you imagine what he saw? Or earth uncorrupted by cities. You know, I, I say corrupted, but like they're really, you know, skies that are corrupted by pollution, um, stuff like that. But he sits there and he looks and he has a lot of time to meditate, right? He didn't pull out his iPhone and start searching the web to see what he was doing, right? His sheep were sleeping and he was on watch making sure that the wolves didn't come and that his sheep were safe. And he's contemplating, contemplating the great majesty of God. And as he looks and starts to see how magnificent God's creation is, and how magnificent the Creator has to be to create this universe, he asked the question, what is man? What is man to you? Why would you remember us? Why would you care for us? He uses a word here that is actually usually used for doctor visits. You know, the care of a physician going and to seeing someone. When David's saying, why do you remember? How do you remember man? How do you care? How do you treat us, these little tiny little beings, related to everything you've created? Why do you care the way you care? And then not only that, you have made him, crowned him with glory, made him ruler over much of the creation. 
And as you look at this, it is very likely that David had in mind the verses in Genesis. Where it says, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. See, if we look back at the beginning, at the beginning of creation, as man and Adam and Eve and God, and we look at the position of glory and honor that they had, they were given dominion or power over everything. But it says they were made a little lower than the angels. And what does that mean? Well, human beings as created have some limitations that angels don't. Angels are spiritual. They aren't bound by the physical. They can move around. They can do things. They have power that men don't have. It doesn't mean that men were less loved. It doesn't mean that they have a lower spiritual relationship with God. They actually had a great intimate fellowship where they walked in the garden with God. But we see that as they speak of this, that man is a little lower than the angels at creation. But then something happened. In verse 2.8 in Hebrews, it says, as it continues, it says, as it is, we do not yet see everything subject to him. So we see in the beginning that everything was subject to man. But now, do we see that today? Do we see the animals and the birds and the plants and everything uh, subject to man? See, in the world we live in, we are not con in control of everything as the Scriptures in Genesis say. See, as sin entered the world, something happened. Because of Adam's sin and the fall of man, mankind was removed from this place of authority, this place of glory and honor. And a curse was given to them, given to us. See, we don't see this world today. We're not, it is not under man's dominion. See, we have fallen to some of the lowest levels of the pecking order in the universe. One commentator wrote, Because all mankind fell in Adam, because he lost his kingdom and his crown, we do not now see the earth subject to man. The earth originally was subject to man, and it supplied all his needs without his having to do anything. He had only to accept and enjoy the earth as it provided for him. Then tempted by Satan, man sinned, and his, and his tempter usurped the crown. There you see the change in the chain of command. Man fell to the bottom, and the earth under the evil one now rules man. And we look at this and we kind of question that, but it did not take long for the fruit of this change to come about. You don't have to read very far before you see the children of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. And you see the first murder. You see hatred. You see the fruit of what is going on here. We look and we see all of these uncontrollable passions and desires start to develop in mankind as they start going out and conquering each other. We get to the time of Noah where, where no one is in control anymore. Where everything is chaos. Where everything is, is, is gone astray. And if we really are honest, not only has man no longer have control of the created of the world, of the animals, man has actually lost control of himself. He is now bound with a new master, a master that is, that is sin, and there is a tempter in our world who is Satan, who knows how to push every button of pleasure that we have possibly known to man and continues to push and push and push. And then man continues to live for the pleasures of life in their own sinful ways. And we look at 1 John 5.19, it says, the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. Is that true? Do we see that? 
Do we see the image in Genesis portrayed and lived out in our world today? From this wonderful creation, this wonderful structure. No, we see chaos and we see sin and we see pain and we see selfishness. See, from that point forward, man and women have constantly strove, constantly battled to be back in control. To, to be the one in authority. To have dominance and dominion over everything. If we look at the council of history, we can see that that is a constant theme through history. Is one group of people having dominance over another group of people and another group of people forcing dominance over another one and another one and another one and another one. It is just what man does is it constantly attempts to dominate again. And we look at today and we must ask ourselves, or maybe we ask ourselves, it's got to be better today, right? Like after these thousands and thousands of years and generations and generations and generations, we're smart enough to have figured it out, right? We're smart enough to learn from our past mistakes. The acts of Cain and Abel still happen every day in this country with hatred and murder and divisiveness. See, we fight for control and we fight for dominance and battle. And we look at it in every aspect of our culture. Every part of our world. There's battle for dominance between men and women. There's battle for dominance between the races, between social classes, between political affiliations. We see it in nations. We see it in wars. We see it in ideologies and what we believe. We see the battle for dominance in the home between husbands and wives. We see it, the battle at home for parents and children. We see it in the workplaces. We see it in our schools. And to be honest, we see it especially in many religious organizations. As leaders attempt to dominate over the lives of their people by manipulation and power, by controlling information. Some of you have seen the video I've shared a little bit of, and I've seen many of these where, where guys will stand in front of the church and say, I am the man of God. I am the one you voted in. I am the one you must listen to. That is not... That is not what's supposed to happen. I've seen, seen uh, videos of, of pastors that are like, if you do not give this much money, and they kick them out of church. Like they literally take these people and they take them out the back door and say, you are not welcome here because you're not funding my lifestyle. And that's the words they're using. And the hardest part about that is everyone else is sitting there okay with it. Or at least not challenging it or not going somewhere else because most likely they have been manipulated into thinking that this is okay. That this is the way it should be. See, we live in a world that wants to control people. I just believe that that's where we're at. We see the attempt to control and manipulate information everywhere. Everywhere. How many of you trust the news nowadays? How many of you trust the good news nowadays? <laughs> How many trust your neighbors, your coworkers? How many of you can honestly raise your hand that you're skeptical about every word that comes out of anybody's mouth? We should be. There's a whole bunch of sinners running around trying to control everyone. But they're out there trying to control how we spend money, how we spend our time, how we live we are researched we are categorized we are quantified for the sole purpose of controlling our behavior getting us to spend money on things getting us to spend time on things getting us to build up other people's kingdoms so that they can feel like they're in control does this sound like the world we live in it is See, the thing is, is no matter how hard man tries to recover what was lost when Adam and Eve fell, when they fell to sin, no matter how much work we put into it, we have no ability to restore it on our own. We can try and we can put the best people that we think in the best places and we cannot restore what was lost. See, the issue is, no matter who is in power in this world, 
It's only by the oppression of others. If, if every group that was marginalized now is in power tomorrow, there would be another marginalized group and someone else in power. Why? Because man is sinful and Satan is running the schemes of this world. As much as we would love a utopia of where the right people are in control of the right things, the reality is that's not going to happen in man's power. The only biblical, God-honoring dominion that we can experience in this world is when we willingly submit to God's word and we submit to each other as we grow in Christ, as we live like him and for him, and as Christ's righteousness through the guidance of the Holy Spirit comes out in our actions and our words and our desires and our methods and everything else that we do. See, this curse cannot be removed by us. It is a curse. Because Hebrews 2.9 goes on and it says, but we do see Jesus. We have this world and we look at it and we can get a little bit maybe discouraged. How many of you get discouraged at where the world's going? Guess what? It's always been going this way. The first brothers killed each other. One killed one, right? It, it hasn't been good for a long time. Like all of it. But we see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So we look at Psalm 8 and as it uses this term son of man, it's gone back and forth between different studies and different theologians, whether it is Christ as son of man or man as son of man, which is uh, humanity is described that way many times, is mostly believed that in Psalms 8, David was speaking of mankind. However, the author of Hebrews brings to light that Jesus, as he is incarnated, as he comes in this world, as he takes on a human nature, he is then a representative for mankind. See, he did not come as an angel. He came as a man as one who will rule in the ever after for all time. He came as a man to be the king of kings of men, the Lord of lords of men. See, Jesus is seated in the place of ultimate authority, but we have not seen all of the promises come to fruition yet. Even though we do not see the crown of glory that's been returned to men, we do see Jesus. We have not seen what was taken away returned in this world. But Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a short time, for the expressed purpose of tasting or experiencing death for everyone. And he has received, it says he has received the crown because he has done this. He has received the place of honor. He has received the ultimate authority because he has done this for who? For us. See, when he says see, we see Jesus, he is not talking about the fact that we can mass produce false images of him and put him all over everywhere. He is not talking about the fact that we can ask an AI bot, what does Jesus look like? What he's saying is we see Jesus. And how do we see Jesus? By faith. Spurgeon wrote, he is not indeed in this text referring to any scene of the Lord by mortal eyes at all. He is speaking of faith. He means a spiritual sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the eye of the soul. It is the act of looking unto Jesus. In that act by which we are saved, we look unto him and are saved from, that, from the very ends of the earth. We look to him and we find salvation. See, as we seek, as everyone in this world seeks and seeks and seeks, we find Jesus through faith. Do we neglect the privilege it is that we get to see Jesus? That through his actions on the cross, through his death and resurrection, through the work that he did, 
that those that have faith in Christ get to see Him daily, every minute of every day. We get to wake up and see Jesus. We get to go to work and see Jesus. We get to sit at home and see Jesus. We have faith to see what we believe what will come. And those that have saving faith in Jesus get to see Him forever. Not just act Christianly, not just do good things. We get to see Jesus. And that seeing should change everything about how we look at the entire world around us. He has been crowned and established, but we do not see him in his throne in this world. We should long to see that day. Do we long for the day that that will be the case? That it won't be something to come. That we will have Christ on his throne and sin will be vanquished and we will get to see him face to face. See, we recognize Christ's current place and we hope for our place to be established. We have been redeemed in condition, but not in dominion. See, we see Jesus, and even as we deal with our sin, because we still struggle from time to time, as we fight against the lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh and the pride of life, we're bombarded every day, all day, with things to take our focus off of Jesus, to put our eyes on other things, to bring our eyes down to the world and fight the battles that are not going to prove to do anything. Only the battle of the cross will do it all. And not only... Has Jesus ended sin forever? But he also, as he went through the cross, gave us his unending righteousness. See, as we look at the world around and all the temptations that Satan throws at us, it is once again by faith that the shield of faith extinguishes the flaming arrows of the evil one. How do we deal with all the temptations that this world is going to throw at us? By faith by focusing our eyes on Jesus. See, the ultimate penalty for sin in the garden was death. By Adam's actions and the human nature, by Adam's actions, the human nature that was good was now corrupted by a sin nature. See, what is nature? It's what someone or something is. See, Adam was, had a nature that was pure, was holy, and then sin entered. And it was corrupted. And it became a sin nature, a fleshly nature. And the penalty for, for, for following in that sin nature was death. Before that, without, without Satan's temptation in the garden, without Adam and Eve's actions and the disobedience to God, there would be no death. Death comes from disobedience. It comes from the curse. There would be no separation from God. There would be no fall from grace. See, it is only Jesus who took on a second nature, who took on a nature of humanity, not giving up his divine nature, but only him did he take on a nature that was not corrupted like ours is. See, Christ took on a human nature that was still pure the way it was supposed to be. And then he lived in that nature a perfect, obedient life to the will of God. He never sinned. He never polluted that. Therefore, because of that, when he went to the cross and died, there was no penalty of death that he deserved. And so death could not hold him because he had not occurred any guilt. But at that same moment, he did not deserve it, but all of man's sins were put on him at that same moment. He took on the sins of humanity, even though he had no guilt himself. 
And then he took the wrath of God when he died. And as he lives and rises again, as he lives today, for those who have faith in him, he gives that life. He gives that righteousness. He imputes it, which means he puts it on us. Nothing that we do, no works, no prayers, no 10,000 church visits. It is only by the work of Christ and his righteousness that gives us life to conquer death. Romans 6, 5, 11 says, For if we have been united with him in likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin, since a person who has died is free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For death he died, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And how are we united with Christ? By faith in him, by seeing him. And we are united with him in death and we are united with him in life. And when, and when everything is restored to him, when he, all dominion is given back to him as king, we will be united with him as well. Revelations 5, 9, 10 says, And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slaughtered and you, were, and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. See, we must fix our spiritual eyes on Jesus continually and constantly. I think we try very hard to compartmentalize at times. I'm going to do my Bible reading and I'm going to focus on Jesus. I'm going to sit down, read my Bible and see Jesus. I'm going to go to church and I'm going to see Jesus. No. We see Jesus every minute of every day in our weakness and in his strength. We should be focused on him in the hardships, in the valleys, on the mountaintops, in the greatest experiences that we have in life, on the day of our marriages, in the day of the loss of our loved ones. We should focus and see Jesus. We must rejoice in our current position as united with Christ. That this world isn't all there is. And that we have been given this crown of position. See, Jesus is with us, Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Jesus' life, John 10, 25-26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked her. Jesus' family, Galatians 4, 4 through 5. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus' love, 1 John 4.10. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then Jesus is victor, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. In the end, the authorities in this world, Satan and the evil spirits and the things that the Bible talks about that is constantly plaguing sinful man will be cast out. Things will be righted once again. And this is our hope, is it not? I mean, how hopeful would it be if eternity was like this for the rest of all time? 
constantly dealing with sin, constantly dealing with sinful people. See, we see all these promises and scriptures of what will come. We see in Revelation 3.21, to the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Dominion of man will be returned, but it won't be like dominion of man now. It will not be dominion of oppression over other people. There will be no sin. There will be no greed, no lust, no pride. There will be position in Christ. So the question is, is what do we put our faith in? Because we are a faithful people. Just we don't put our faith in the right things. We believe every day. How many of you came in today and questioned whether your chair would hold you or whether gravity would stop and you might float away as you walk to your car today? We trust in many things. And many times we have faith in the wrong things. We have faith in people. We have faith in systems. We have faith in organizations. But there is only one place that we should put our faith, and that is in Christ. And do, even in our churches, do we put our faith in Christ? As I look out and talk with a lot, I guess I would probably argue that many churches aren't putting their faith in Christ. They're putting their faith in the things they create, in their own ideas, in their new revelation. Their faith is in themselves, in what they can create, what they can build, how many people you can get in a building, how big can you make it, and what happens in the end to most of those. But in the end, the only thing that's lasting is faith in Christ. Hebrews, this is another quote from a commentary. If we see Jesus being always with us, from morning till evening, in life, in death, what noble Christians it will make us. Now we shall not get angry with each other so quickly. We shall see Jesus. And we cannot be angry when that dear loving face is in view. And when we have been affronted, we shall be ready to forgive when we see Jesus. Who can hate his brother when he sees that face, that tender face, more marred than that of any man? May we, each one of us, have this, and may it be the expression of our life, we see Jesus. And then we shall be able to go farther and say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As we go around our day, as we look at at what is the church, as we live in this world that is not yet to come, as we live in this world that will be taken away and be changed in a new world to come, how will it change us as families? If we look at our husbands and wives with Jesus right there, or our children, to see our children as blessings from Jesus. Horrible, sanctifying blessings sometimes. (laughs) In many cases, but then so are we at parenting and at husbandry and I don't know what the other word is. (laughs) Wifery, I'll make a word today. But as we look at this, connecting people to Christ and one another, as we look to Christ, there is a unity that will come in the church. As we deal with this world, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, it says, Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, making effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace 
was given to each other, to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive, he gave gifts to the to people. But what does he ascend mean? That he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith, in seeing Jesus and in the knowledge of God's Son. Not the knowledge of everything else. We receive unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and techniques of deceit. Do we see that today? Being blown around by every new fad, new idea, new way of thinking, and we constantly find ourselves on unsteady land, on unsteady legs, instead of on Christ. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head Christ. For him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. So the reason I read that section is even though, as the author brings in Hebrews, that the dominion of man was lost, and sin entered the world, and the dominion of man has not been returned, there is still this place, the body of Christ, this place, the, the families of Christ that come together as Christ is the head. There is this place that we can see and we can develop and we can grow into the likeness of Christ. Into things that are contrary to the world. He started that section with humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing one another in love. Is that contrary to our world today? Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another in love. The unfortunate thing is I think many go to churches and the last thing they get is a bunch of people that are humble, gentle, patient, and loving. And those, all those things require effort to work through the hard stuff. Because it doesn't discount the fact that there are sinners, people who sin in the church. We have to work through that. Patience, love are all tested. They're all developed in conflict. However, in the body of Christ, that conflict should be, resol should be resolved with a vision of Christ in humility, in patience, in gentleness and in kindness until we wait for the return of Christ. And so as we look at this, the first question we must ask is, are you united to Christ by faith? You may know all the answers. You may have studied Him. But do you have a faith? Do you believe that what the Bible says about Jesus that He came as the fulfillment of the, pro of the promises of the Old Testament, that He died on the cross for the sins of man, that as He went into the grave, He conquered that. As He came back out of the grave, He bestows righteousness, His life, to those who believe in Him. And when He does that, the shackles of sin are removed, the bondage of sin is taken away, and for the first time, we are free to live in line with Scripture. We are free to glorify God in truth. We are free to grow. Do we have, do you have that freedom? 
Or do you still try and do it all yourself? I'm in control. I can be better. I can do this. I can get through this. I just have to work harder. Just have to do more. I'm telling you right now, it's never going to happen. It is submission to Christ and life by faith that we are saved. Another question, have you been united to the body of Christ? As we have talked a lot about what it means to be a church, this is my hope and this is what I I believe is happening here. Is that families are coming together and they're working through the hard stuff. Is there conflict? Yeah, we've, we've had conflict here. But I've also seen a lot of reconciliation start. I've seen forgiveness. I've seen people working through things. Have you found a place? Have you committed and brought your, as it talks about, your place in the body? Every Christian in the body has a place, has a purpose, has something to give, something to teach. How do we respond? Will we submit to Christ or we will continue to fight for what was taken away? How many of you have had that kid that you take away a toy and they're just fixated on that toy? And they, all they want is that toy back over and over and over and over and over again. And you look at them and it's like, all I asked you to do was clean your room and you can have your toy back. And they're like, no, I want my toy. I'm going to be rebellious. I'm going to be... I want my toy, right? And they're fixated on what they don't have instead of just being obedient and going, hey, if I spend five minutes taking my laundry downstairs, I could get my toy back, right? But we kind of live that way, don't we? We're fixated on all the stuff we don't have instead of focusing on what we do have. And that is saving life in Christ. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray as we go into your word today, if there's anything that I said today that is not of you, Lord, I just pray that you would wash that from the minds of of your people. Lord, I pray as we look at the world around us that we will not get fixated on the battles that you do not want us to fight in lieu of focusing on you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that all of us as believers, as your church led by you, guided by you, striving to be sanctified by you, that we will grow in your likeness, that we will mature, not on the surface, but in the depths of our hearts. That the wounds, the hurts, the pains, all of the shame, all of those things that the enemy continues to help help us keep focused on, Lord, I just pray that we would put that aside and see you, that your faith and in faith in you, that you will remove that shame. You will remove those hurts. You will heal the wounded. And I pray as we come to you that we will continue to keep you focused on everything we do, It is so easy easy to be distracted in our world, Lord. I thank you for your Holy Spirit and the work you're doing amongst the believers here. Lord, I pray you protect our families. Protect us from the, the things that are happening around us, Lord. May we continue to honor you, glorify you by word and deed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we come to the Lord's table today, as we come to communion, it's once again a time for us to reflect on who? On Jesus. It's a great, great time after speaking of, do you see Jesus? On the the night of the Lord's Supper, see the Lord brought this meal forward. And so as we look at this, this this is a, a, a sacrament. It is something that believers do in response to their Savior. So we ask that if you are not, if you have not put your faith in Christ, that you refrain from this. But if you're curious, I'd love to answer questions about that. So if you're not a believer, we ask that you, but as you spend some time in prayer, think about this morning, 
What do you put your faith in? What have you put your faith in? Do you need to make some changes there? And then as time allows, when you are ready, come up and take the elements of the, of the juice and the bread and then hold on to those and that once everyone's gathered them, we'll come up and we'll take them together. So let's take some time to, time to pray and come and grab them. So on the night before, the entire world changed. When Christ died on the cross, he sat with his disciples. And he told them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, gave it to them, and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Dear Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for your love on the cross, demonstrated in a way that we will never completely understand. As David looked out at the majesty of your creation and said, what is man to you? Lord, we must ask the same question. What is man that you would send your son, that Jesus would come, take on human nature, experience all of the horrible things to save us, to redeem us, to reconcile us back to you? We thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.